Alrighty, so we're going to jump into video number three, talking about Giselle, and uh, it'll be early branching stages right before the hack, so we'll get right into it. Okay, so in this video we're going to talk about the early training stage, sort of the brancher stage before hacking. Um, we're at the point now where your bird will stand for the first time, your IS bird, your imprint bird. And the first time they stand, that's when I like to put on anklets. I like to use initially, uh, in this early branching stage and during the hack, rolled leather anklets, and then eventually leather jesses, and then I like to switch to braided anklets and uh, braided jesses later on in the, uh, after hacking, during the hunting. So, the first time I see the iris or the, the imprint stand, the first time I saw Giselle stand, at that point, their feet are pretty developed, their tarsus are pretty developed, they're not going to get much bigger, and it's pretty safe to go ahead and put an anklet on them so you can size it appropriately. Uh, once they have been standing for a little while and, and they're holding in that standing position a little more, then I go ahead and throw the jesses in. And, you know, at this point, they're still a little wobbly, they, they don't have enough power to tear at the equipment, so it's the perfect time to get the equipment on the IS or the imprint bird, the young bird, where they can't damage it, where they won't hurt themselves by picking at it, and they give up pretty quickly, and they, and they sort of just adjust to it and adapt to it very quickly. So once they're standing for a bit of time, the, the jesses go in. Again, I like to use leather jesses on a, on a leather-rolled anklet. And then I like to use a, a Jess washer, a leather Jess washer. That keeps the Jess in the anklet so the, the young bird can't pull it out. And then I transition to braided equipment later on when they're a little older. Um, the, the braided anklets that I like to use, I get from Mike's Falconry. It's really good braided anklets, really good equipment. That's what I use for Giselle, and they've actually lasted her three years now. I need to get a new pair, but they've done an amazing job for three years. No tarsal damage, no scale damage. I haven't had any issues with them. Occasionally, if you make your braided anklets incorrectly, their their back toe can get stuck in it, but the same thing can happen with, with incorrectly made leather anklets. So that's just something to watch out for whenever you're using any kind of equipment on your hawk. But again, I, I tend to go with flat braided anklets and uh, braided jesses with a leash extender, braided leash extender with a swivel on it um, later on. So as I go into this, some of, some of these things might be unknown to you, but the Modern Apprentice website is a really good resource for all kinds of falconry related things, um, diseases, diets, equipment. They talk about all kinds of perches in there. So I'm going to be mentioning a lot of different perches and other equipment in these videos. And if there's something that you haven't heard of before, I'll try to put you know, pictures and, and videos of that equipment in the videos. But if you haven't heard of it, go to the Modern Apprentice. It's a good resource website. So at this point, the, the bird is standing for short periods of time. You put the jesses in. Then they begin walking. Uh, as soon as they start walking, I like to tie them to a perch. You have to be careful with that. You don't want to tie them to a perch too early because you don't want them to hurt their newly developing legs. So I do that really under supervision. And I like to tie them to a block perch. A block perch is, you know, has the round top and they can walk around it because they're not going to spend much time on the perch at this point. And so I'll, I'll put the nest tub next to the perch and they can spin around the perch and they can, they can hop up to the top of the block perch if they want. But um, it, it's not a bow perch. It's not a main perch. They, they can't recover on a perch at this point in time and at this age. So uh, again, I like a block perch to start with. And this is for short periods of time so they can learn to be restrained. If you teach them to be restrained at a younger age, it's just much easier later on in their life for them to adjust to it. And that's what you're looking for is get them used to things now that they need to get used to later on that you're gonna be doing with them later on. And the earlier you can expose them to these things without them hurting themselves, the better they adapt to it. And that's what you're looking for. You're, gonna, you're looking for a bird that eventually is just gonna be calm in all these situations and all these things seem normal and they're just totally cool with it. So I like to set up a playpen. Um, you know, I use like a dog fence or a dog gate 
and I'll put that against a wall in my house. And then I have the, the block perch in there. I'll put their nest hub in there. I put the remote controlled car that I'll eventually use for training in there. I put a leather lure in there and then um, whatever type of lure you're gonna train them to, you know, maybe a rabbit lure or a crow lure for a, a goshawk or if you have a cooper sock, it might be a starling lure or a quail lure. Um, so, you know, you know, pick whatever works for you. I also like to put uh, a gauntlet in there and I tend to use rodeo gloves, bull riding gloves. They're, they're still leather protection. They go down the arm fairly far, sort of like a gauntlet, but they're not as hefty. And it just has always been more comfortable for me to do that. I also learned that from other falconers that were doing that and they were, they were flying eagles and red-tailed hawks and using rodeo gloves. And what it kind of makes you do is kind of forces you to um, adapt and train the bird well so they're not sticky footed, so they're not grabbing the glove because the, the rodeo glove, the bull riding glove will only protect you so much. So it it's one of those things that you have to ease into, but it can be helpful in giving you feedback on your bird and, and adjusting their behavior a little bit more. So they're really good and sort of gentle on the glove. Um, but again, nothing wrong with using a gauntlet. Mike's Falconry has amazing gauntlets and I do have a bunch of gauntlets like that also. Um, but with Giselle, I use a, a rodeo or a bull riding glove. So that's in the playpen area. Also, <clears throat> eventually I'll put a water bowl in there, a water dish. I'll start off with a really small one, not when they're too young. I don't want them to drown in it. And eventually you'll move to a larger one. You want to make sure that your, your water dishes for your falcons, hawks, whatever you have, are rounded on the top and that they're angled out on the bottom. So eventually when you do tie them out, if the leash wraps around the water, it'll slide up and over. But if you have, you know, what I use for a nest bowl, I wouldn't use that for a water dish because the sides of the walls are going the opposite direction. If the leash gets caught here on the bottom, it won't slide over the top easily, it'll get stuck at this point. So you wanna, you wanna choose your water bowls, water dishes wisely. Again, something you can find on Mike's Falconry. Um, so once they begin to jump out of the playpen area, I'll start keeping them tied down kind of all the time. I, tie them, I start tying them down all the time inside and at work right before they're able to really hop out of the playpen. That playpen is about three and a half feet tall, four feet tall. So at that point, they're getting pretty mobile. And again, you want to restrain them early so they get used to it. So during this early uh, brancher stage, I take my, my young birds to work. I'm lucky enough to be on a farm. We have a barn and there's horses and there's people and there's vehicles and there's all kinds of noise and, and interaction. So it's good for socializing them. And I put them in an enclosed pen. Um, you know, when they're, when they're too young to actually get out of the nest tub, I usually keep them in the office and I'll put them outside for short periods. But once they're somewhat mobile and they start moving around, I'll just leave them outside and then I just go and check on them. But I leave them outside in this enclosed pen so they're totally safe, but they can, you know, take in the world. And once they're pretty mobile, then I'll start tying them to a perch in that enclosed playpen. Uh, you can use a wall perch or a loop perch. Again, I like the block perch, it's just easy. And I have one that's mobile and it's just heavy and weighted so I don't have to stick it in the ground. And this enclosed pen is usually elevated on a table. So then after work, I'll, I'll take the young bird home, generally around four or 5 p.m. and I let them loose in the backyard. And it's a, it's a heavily supervised sort of tame hack in the backyard. So I'll, I'll grab a book or have friends come over and we just hang out in the backyard. And this is eventually where I'm going to hack the bird. And I just let them do their thing. At, again, at this point, they're a brancher. So they're, they're mobile, but they're not flying anywhere. And so they hop around on the ground and they're exploring and they're attacking sprinklers. And they're, you know, jumping on barbecues, make sure the barbecues are not turned on. They're, they're jumping on low-level things, they're jumping into bushes, they're exploring, they're learning how to use their body, how to grip, how to move around. And so I do this until sunset, almost every night. And when, once it starts to get dark, I'll call them into you know, the rabbit lure or whatever lure you might be using for that particular bird, a starling lure, and give them their second feeding. And then I bring them in for the evening. When I bring them in, I put them on or put them in their playpen and I tie them down to the perch at that point. And then that's usually around 8 or 9 p.m. And then we hang out until 10 p.m. or 11. I'll have the TV on or things happening in the house. 
And then when it's time for bed, I will untie them, put them in the nest tub, and put them in either a giant hood or a dog crate. If I'm using a dog crate, I'll add, um, I don't know exactly what it's called. It's, it's sort of like particle board. It has a lot of holes in it, and you, you put it up on a wall in a tool room so you can hang tools and pegs off of it. And I'll put that on the grate of the dog crate. And depending on the type of dog crate it is, I'll flip it upside down. So those, those two window grates are on the bottom. And I'll put that material on the window grates and on the door. And then I'll put a perch in there. And so that's where the bird will sleep, either in there or in a giant hood. And I do that because it gets them used to staying in, in the giant hood or, or travel crate. And then it's much easier, easier to travel with them later. Um, initially, when I did that with Giselle, it took her about five minutes to settle down in that crate. Uh, and then she was totally calm and, and slept through the night. Obviously, it's, you know, I turn off all the lights and it's pitch dark at that point. And she travels really well in that, in that crate and in her giant hood. And she sort of does the same thing. It takes her about five minutes to settle down. She jumps around a bit. But then when I go on these long, you know, road trips into other states for a week or two at a time, she does really well in that, in that traveling crate because of this time spent. And initially I put the nest tub in, then I take the nest tub away and I just leave a towel and I leave a perch in there and then they'll start sleeping on the towel. But eventually once they're comfortable with perching at night, they'll, they'll sleep on the perch. At this point, I'll also start weighing and measuring out the food intake. And I've made a mistake in the past where I like to get a variety of food for whatever young bird I was raising. And I would switch between mice and rats and quail and rabbit and squirrel. And that's really good for variety. But once you get close to the hack, you, you want to start being able to understand how food is going to affect them and their weight and their metabolism. And so I would switch to one type of food, like just quail or just rat or whatever you feel comfortable with, and then just supplement it with VitaHawk or some other kind of supplement. And that way you, you have better and more control of their weight and, and you know exactly what you're feeding and how much you're feeding and how it's going to affect them. So that's something that I like to, to move towards. So at this point, the basic day is I, I have the baby imprint bird, IS bird, brancher in the crate or the giant hood. And in the morning I wake up. I take them out and weigh them. Initially, I'm weighing them in the nest tub, and I know how much the nest tub weighs. Once they're comfortable, you know, stepping up onto the gloved hand and standing and perching, then I'll put them on the scale itself and weigh them. So they come out of the crate, they get weighed, they get fed on the leather lure, uh, and then I take them to work and either put them in or tie them onto the perch in their enclosed playpen, their, their safe playpen in the, you know, the busy barn area or whatever, wherever that might be for you. Uh, once work is done, they go home. And, and this is all good, this traveling in the truck, it's what you're gonna be doing later on. So I'm sort of just simulating what the day is gonna look like for the bird when they're older and they're hunting. So they get a lot of car travel time in. So I take them home from work, it's around four or 5 p.m. We go hang out in the backyard, the bird is loose, they get to hop around and explore things. Um, test things out, jump on bushes, you know, wh whatever they want to do to their heart's desire. You do have to keep an eye out on other hawks to make sure that nothing's going to snatch them. The neighbor's dog isn't coming over, you know, do this in a place that you have a little bit of control over. And then I'll call them down to the rabbit lure or a frozen starling or frozen quail or whatever your lure is that, that is the prey item you sort of want them to imprint on. And then I feed them up and bring them inside they get tied down and tied down in the enclosed play pen area, um, hang out for a couple hours, TV and other things going on in the house, and eventually they get put to bed in the crate. So that's the basic uh, process that I use for the early, you know, branching stage before I get to hacking. And in the next video, we'll we'll jump right into talking about uh, what I did with Giselle and her hack and what I've done with some other birds in the past. Thanks for watching and uh, look forward to the next video.